afternoon. Uh, I wish it was better weather, but I will try to condense this as much as I can. Again, my name is Brittany Walker, and I'm here to introduce to you a Tennessee sculptor by the name of E.T. Wickham, one of great importance to me because he happens to be my great-grandfather. So um, my educational background kind of led me into conserving folk art kind of a long and winding road, but I'm happy to be here. Um, when I started this project about a year ago, I had three questions in mind. Um, I was curious about the local and county significance of Wickham's public folk art park. I was also wanting to know how the community reacted to his work and what has been done since the artist's death to restore these works. And then my last question was, how does Wickham's Park compare to other public folk art parks, which we've seen earlier today, um, installations in the United States? So looking at Wickham's family history, the Wickham family has a rich history in England, but they came to the United States in 1787, where Harvey Wickham and his wife had a son, Nathaniel, while aboard the ship. Now this Nathaniel was the grandfather to, to E.T. Wickham. So the three of them migrated to North Carolina and settled in what is now Palmyra, which is Montgomery County, Tennessee, by the end of 1787. And Harvey built a cabin that still exists today. It's not in great condition, but it's still there. And E.T. Wickham was the grand, grandchild of Nathaniel and also the youngest of 10 children who survived to adulthood. And the two images on the outside are of E.T. Wickham and his brother. Obviously, he is the younger of the two. And the middle image is of the Wickham family crest. So before he started his career as a sculptor, he was a farmer. He was born in 1887, and he hated his first name, which was Enoch, Enoch Tanner Wickham, and he hated it. So he wanted people to call him E.T. or Tanner. He left school after the sixth grade to help out with the family tobacco farm because his brothers were going off to fight in World War I. In 1906, at the age of 19, he married um, Lena Annie Yarbrough and converted to Catholicism, unlike the rest of his family, which, who were Baptist. He, um, he took over the tobacco farming and invented a wheat, wheat thrasher to use on the farm as well, and was known as a well-known land surveyor. He was also given an award by the department of interior and agriculture for the efforts to reforest wasteland. And he learned to use concrete during this time to dam lakes in the area, which we will see in his art in just a moment. In 1952, uh, Tanner was 65 years old. He retired and moved down the street away from his family. He and his wife built a new cabin and started a new life. And he just decided that he was going to start sculpting. So what he did was he wanted space by the road where he could create his work. He knew from the very beginning that he wanted his work to be public. And the medium that he chose was concrete. And you can see on the left the base of one of his works. And then on the right, E.T. sitting on a park bench, just love and retirement. So um, he, he found the models for his works in encyclopedias and newspapers. He didn't travel much, so these were his inspiration. He loved history and followed politics closely. And during this period of about 20 year span, he created between 40 to 50 works of art. And granted, this is between when he was 65 years old to almost 85, which is pretty incredible. So the process of creating his sculpture, he would meld together scraps of iron, whether it be cans, coat hangers, 
stovepipes, old car parts, anything that he had just lying around on a hand-built forge to create the armature or skeleton of the work. He would use a handmade mix of concrete and applied a thick layer, which dried quickly, so it didn't give him much time to carve out details. Once it dried, he applied layers of enamel paint and added props such as glasses, coats, top hats, anything that he saw appropriate. And each statue took approximately six weeks. And there's a great quote on the slide that I'd like to read to you. Somehow, Wickham and his statues are accepted by the people of Palmyra as the most creative and natural expression of their temperament. Wickham, the old man of the hills, somehow captured the primitive spirit of America. This is written by Daniel Prince, art critic. Um, he was uh, not the happiest man, kind of ornery, as my family likes to call him. So this is Wickham Stone Park, a diagram that I created from the beginning. Wickham wanted his work to be public, and it's shown here. Um, we have two sides of the road. The west side of the road was religiously motivated sculptures, and on the east side of the road, we have political and culturally motivated sculptures, which are broken into themes. And at some point, someone named it Wickham Stone Park. So that's what it's named now. Uh, local and state dignitaries attended public ceremonies to unveil Wickham's latest work, and many included dedication ceremonies. By 1966, he had visitors from as far as Can far north as Canada and as far south as Florida to come see the statues and watch him work. So three main themes come out of his work, the first of which is politics. And as you can see from this work, this is an unusual one for his. When we start looking at more of his work, you'll see this is um, definitely kind of the, the black sheep of the family, I guess you could call it. Uh, the political works were usually based on men in office that he admired at the time and military themes. And close relatives that fought in the Civil War, World War I, and World War II. So he had a deep admiration for the life and dedication of a soldier. Kneeling soldier, which is shown on the screen, is one of the most unique arts works that he created. In the 1960s, it was actually commissioned by the federal government as a war memorial for an outdoor museum at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, which is not far from where he grew up. And it's based off of the spirit of infantry at Arlington Cemetery, which I'm sure he saw in an encyclopedia. He was, he was actually transported by helicopter for the dedication ceremony. And this is a story my mother loves to tell. She was, she and her family came over to his house and they, they hauled the statue away and the helicopter landed on his property and my great grandfather stood up and he kind of, you know, dusted off his overalls and his blazer and said, well, my ride is here. And <laughs> it's a pretty big deal for someone who had only been in a car maybe half a dozen times. So <laughs> pretty good story. Um, it's unique because, this statue is unique because it's not representative of his style at all, but shows that he had the, the ability to create very realistic arts. And this shows us that his unique folk art style was a choice, not a lack of ability. So this next, this next sculpture set shows three politicians as well as the Liberty Bell including John F. Kennedy. Um, later, Robert Kennedy would be added after he was assassinated. And on the left and right, we have letters from the Secretary to the President of the United States saying, thank you so much for writing. Um, basically, somebody in the family, I don't know if it was E.T. or somebody who was a little more literate, wrote to whoever he sculpted. So, hey, I, wrote a, I uh, created a statue for you. We would love to have you come see it. So he would get these letters, and luckily we have records of them. 
They were in no chronological sequence. His statues seem to be just kind of random as far as, as chronology, but I'm sure that he has some sort of technique in mind. It's just not known at the moment. The next theme is family works. On the left, you see Selma, who a picture of one of his first sculptures, a sculpture of his dog, his foxhound. On the right, you can see E.T. Wickham standing next to the World War II Memorial. Most of his works were about that size, just to put these into scale. Um, he would build giant pedestals with these sculptures on top. And in the center, one of his most controversial sculptures is from 1961. It's in Octaner on Blue Bull. And this is very controversial because it also is a reference to Paul Bunyan and Babe. So there's arguments over, you know, which story it is. Um, on the, the inscription on the base reads, E.T. Wickham headed to the wild and wily west. Remember me, boys, while I'm gone. And then it also says, do not touch or swing on these statues. So even at that time, there was some vandalism going on, unfortunately. There were electric bulbs for the eyes of the bull on, and on several of his sculptures. He was a self-taught electrician. And let's see. The next theme are religious works. He was a devout, he, he converted to Catholicism at the age of 19 and it was a very important theme to him late in life. This on the left is his smallest sculpture. It's about a foot long, and he created it for his daughter, Sister Justina, who became a nun in a convent in Alabama, and I think that's as far as he ever traveled. He, the right is Fatima, which he created in 1959, she stands on top of a 30-foot pole resembling a tree trunk, and there are also lighting elements to create a halo. She is the center of an unfinished, very important installation by Wickham, uh, a sundial that he created with apostles standing at every hour position, the three children of Fatima, the Portugal story, and lambs. The concrete, there was a concrete wall at the base that is about four inches in height, which, ma which made um, marking the time of the day when the shadow is cast, so it tell the time. And Wickham was trying to create the largest sundial in the world. He had apparently had a copy of the Guinness Book of World Records. Who knows how old it was, but he was trying to compete with that. And a reporter wrote in one of the articles that the sundial was off by one minute from his watch, but he he trusted Wickham's sundial more than his watch. Vandalism and destruction. This happened even before Wickham died, um, particularly in the 60s. Palmyra is a very secluded area, not a lot to do out there, no Walmarts to go hang out at, <laughs> just a very quiet, not a lot of street lamps, very quiet area. Um, this is one of the statues that is the least vandalized, unfortunately. So you can see, I'm just going to show you a series of his works. On the left are images from as early as I can find. Some images do not exist of statues that were completely destroyed. And then on the right are images from 2014 that I took a few months ago. So this is of Andrew Jackson. This is the, the E.T. Wickham on the Blue Bowl. And as you can see, um, no, it no longer has a human with it. It's just kind of a amorphous, you can kind of tell it's a bowl. It's very strange, there's very colorful graffiti on it. We have Sam Davis and Bill Marsh, the Civil War monument with Sam Davis, the, the former Confederate spy, is shown here after the war shaking hands with Bill Marsh, 
a former Union spy and grandfather to E.T. Wickham. And you can see the heads were just completely taken off. Um, vandalism was, especially after Wickham died, um, it became shotgun targets. The statues became a fun, it was a cool thing to back up your truck into the statues to try to see how many you could break. It was interesting to try to shoot them with your guns or who could carve the crudest language into these. And oh, if you got the head taken off, then it's 50 points. And if you shot an arm off, it's 10 points. It's very sad, very, very sad. So the once 40 to 50 works of art has dwindled down to less than 20 and most of them are not as intact as the one on the screen. The next one is probably the most intact. It's the doctor's memorial inscribed with the names of 16 people who served as physicians um, in Montgomery County, including his brother. He had a lot of respect for the medical profession. We have John Wickham on horseback, honoring his brother John. And John received his medical degree at Vanderbilt, which is a huge deal for, for his, or my family, and in 1885. And he also served on the 1901 session of the Tennessee House of Representatives, along with his friend Austin P. of Clarksville, who later became the governor of Tennessee. And he served as chairman of the Committee of Sanitation in, and introduced the bill which provided for the licensing and pr of practicing physicians. So pretty big deal. And as you can see on the left, beautiful, the paints are just bright and colorful and now at least, at least it's somewhat intact, but you don't get the same, it's just not the same work anymore, unfortunately. And you can see on the, on the far right an image. So he got the mustache Spot on, I think. Um, this is the same work that we looked at earlier, but with Robert Kennedy added to it after his assassination. And here's how it appears today. You can see that kudzu and plenty of other plants are kind of growing over these works as well. If you look at the image on the left, this is how the this is how the park looked in 1965. The sculptures were close together, but you can see the props, for example, the covering over the wagon. And in some of these images, if you look close closely, you can see um, hats on some of the figures. And now all that's left are the two the two that are the team of ox, oxen. Um, the oxen were modeled after a team that Wickham drove into the city for supplies and equipment because he rarely would ride in a car. And again, this is the World War II memorial, decapitated. I think, I think there's part of one arm and a lot of graffiti, a lot of damage done to it. So, recognition of Wickham's work. Now that we look at all the terrible things that have been done to these concrete statues, while the site still draws visitors, the height of the popularity after Wickham's death halted. But in 2001, the Customs House Museum and Cultural Center in Clarksville put on an ex exhibition called E.T. Wickham, A Dream Unguarded. It is the first and only exhibit on the artist. And why 2001? The director of the museum, Ned Crouch, is a folk, artist, folk art specialist and had a long time interest in Wickham and his work. He wanted to draw attention to the site and urge the community to rediscover and appreciate these works. Um, the exhibit was very successful but was not out for very long. And the catalog is the only publication that is dedicated to the artist. So there are no books written on him yet. <laughs> so 
the restoration in the World's Fair, Ned, the same Ned Crouch, then working at Austin P, was given permission by the Wickham family to restore five works. Um, and he was contacted by the World's Fair official about, about the World's Fair in Knoxville, which was happening in 1982, and asked if they could show Wickham's work. So they worked really hard and they came up with four that were displayed. And as you can see, these are all stages of one of the works, Joseph and Christ Child, which looks so much better than it did. I wish I'd put one of the slides on, but they have heads now, which is very important. So comparisons to other artists, obviously there are there's precedent for public concrete parks. Um, I don't know that Wickham ever got to see any of these, but maybe he saw them in encyclopedias. But the Garden of Eden in, and the Wisconsin Concrete Park, there are definitely parallels that can be drawn from them. So last slide, the future and preservation uh, opportunities for restoration, which would be an ideal and goal. This is what I'd like to write my dissertation on and hopefully find a grant to actually go in and work with, work with a group to restore some of these sculptures. And working with uh, Middle Tennessee State University, they have a concrete industry management. And not much has been written on the topic, so there's plenty of room to grow from that. But I'm hoping to keep the spirit of my great-grandfather's works alive. Thank you.